Next, from Springfield, we talk to Representative Ron Sandek as he reacts to Speaker Madigan's 500-page budget bill, which legislators were only given an hour to read before voting on it. This runs about 15 minutes. Representative Ron Sandek, thanks for joining us again on the Illinois Channel. We are here in what is supposed to be the last week of session, and, uh, and sadly it probably won't be, but we shall see. Uh, one of the things I'll tell the viewers is that in the last week of session, you never know what's going to happen. And yesterday was a in part. You had had a press conference, the Illinois Channel was there midway through the day, talking about the working groups, how you're getting bipartisan support and working through issues tied to a possible budget solution. And then lo and behold, at uh, about five o'clock in the afternoon or so, a 500 page bill is thrown on your desk. You have an hour to review it and vote on it. What is the public to make of this that after all this time where the governor and the speaker and everyone's involved in trying to work it out that all of a sudden you just have without any notice and you, as a member of the legislature you didn't know it was coming as no. I understand. What are we to make of this whole situation that this happens and then the entire way that the debate was handled and, the, and that the uh, immediately going out of session afterwards? Nothing about yesterday was a good example of democracy. Unfortunately, not usual near the end of session in Illinois. It's not the end game either. So um, it was disappointing that the speaker decided to drop a budget bill at 4.56 p.m. and we're debating it two hours later. It's a 500-page budget bill that no one read. Not the, not the sponsor of the bill. No member of the House read that bill. What's more, Terry, is that bill purported to spend $40 billion in fiscal year 2017, even though the sponsor acknowledged reluctantly and very late that the state expects, give or take a few bucks, to bring in only $33 billion, leaving a more than $77 billion operating deficit for fiscal year 2017 on top of the $7.6 billion that we have in unpaid bills right now, doubling the deficit. Clearly, it's an unbalanced budget. Clearly, it is. It can't be the finished product. I don't think for a second the Senate is really going to entertain and pass that bill. And if somehow I'm wrong, I guarantee you, the governor won't sign it. No chance. So we're going to be back talking about the budget. I prefer it would be this week. I prefer we get it done before Tuesday. To your earlier point, it's very likely that's not going to be the case because it's a lot to do in a short period of time. So we may be back in two weeks or a month. It wouldn't surprise me, Terry, if the governor calls us back this time. This is a different time than last year. Last year, you'll remember, we were in continuous session, and it was the speaker bringing us back. Although we didn't ever really work on a budget, we had committees of the whole and a variety of busy activities, but we never really worked on a budget. And you'll remember, because I was in Passfield House with you, and I encouraged Deputy Majority Leader Lang to have a committee of the whole on the budget and actually do that. Obviously, they didn't take me up, no surprise. But the process has been awful. So that was a uh, not so nice slap in the face, cold water from the speaker, because amid that, as you said, we were having very good bipartisan conversations on reforms. I'm in those groups. They have been productive. They have been collegial. And they have been, uh, in all respects, bipartisan, bicameral, and helpful. Don't have agreement on everything. We have solid agreements on a variety of matters under every topic. Combining that with a framework that different groups did on a budget is a way out. By the way, a really tough way out. We're talking about cuts, we're talking about revenue and reforms. No one is gonna be happy with the combination. Everyone will be a little disappointed. A tough pill for everyone to swallow, a tough vote to take or votes. But that's exactly what settlements and negotiated deals are. No one gets a grand slam. Everyone should be happy with a single, and, and you move on. So that's the goal, and I still well, think it's It would be nice attainable. if the budget uh, was balanced. Not, not, not nice. It's about darn time, and it's actually required. 
which is where this governor is very different than, frankly, no disrespect to others, that signed unbalanced budgets, that we they were knowingly unbalanced. Yeah, everyone, I mean, in, in years past, uh, you knew that the, the budget document was passed, so it gave legal authority to spend money, but as we saw a year ago, uh, the previous budget had run out of money come April. And right. one of the first budget, the first budget deal Governor Rounder did was to patch the hole in the- 1.6 billion. Previous. Uh, right, so when he got to the office, he was in months and he had to patch a $1.6 billion plug because the first, because the last Quinn budget wasn't balanced. And then of course last year, we didn't have a budget because the Democrats sent him a spending plan, expected him to cut $4 billion from that plan. No way. He vetoed 99% of it, and we've been at odds ever since. So what happened yesterday, we had this vote, it, it passed. Right. Uh, then uh, House uh, Republican Leader Durkin, you and the Republican Caucus uh, came out and talked to the press about how irritated you were, to use a nice word, uh, about the way this was done, that you had a budget jam down your throats. Going back to what's happening behind the scenes here with your Democratic colleagues, but you say you're working in a bipartisan way, the, the rank and file members. Did you talk to them about what happened oh, yeah. and, and what, are, what are their thoughts? I mean, without, you, I'm not gonna throw anybody under the bus, Terry, but to a person I spoke with, no one liked what they saw. Um, Everyone expressed some chagrin and wished it didn't happen that way, but let me make sure I put some color on your comment. We weren't just disgusted with what happened. It was in the way it happened as well. And there was a clear violation of the Democrats' draconian rules. These are their rules. They're decidedly partisan, decidedly one-sided, and they beat the heck out of us with them regularly. But when you can't even follow your own draconian rules and you have to use shortcuts, to beat up the minority, you really got a problem. They did two things last night that were wrong. You know, they, they called the question, meaning to truncate debate, shorten it up, and go right to a vote. That requires a roll call vote. That was clarified two hours earlier by the parliamentarian for the speaker. So that was a violation. But more importantly, we requested a verification of the roll call vote. It was acknowledged in the record, meaning we wanted to make sure everyone pushed their own button and that they had you know, the constitutionally required majority. And by the way, I don't believe they did last night. And, I, and they gaveled out immediately in violation of the rules. Today, the Speaker of the House himself was at the podium. And in a very clever way, he called a motion to reconsider. That actually wasn't technically correct, but whatever, right? So it wasn't a reconsideration because that vote was never even legally taken. So they zapped it from the record and we revoted. And we had some of the same conversation far more uh, calm though but we got the same result they passed the bill with purely partisan 61 i think 60 but then one person said he would have voted if he could that's not going to hold water just not going to do it and the senate democrats to their credit have come out pretty aggressively saying it's a bad budget so i doubt they'll even entertain it terry which would be great and so uh, the other thing that budget uh senate bill 2048 was the the number on the bill, right. uh, did not include any accommodation for what the, gov the governor has been demanding to get something out of it. Right. Uh, the Republican leaders have said in earlier conversations they'll vote to put uh, some new revenues, meaning a tax increase, but they're not going to do that without some reforms. Right. Um, and so I... It's I, not hard I, to understand. Yeah, no, I mean, I just, I, I, I'm not... Uh, it was one of the more shocking things in almost 20 years of covering this, that they would just dump such a large bill at the last minute that seemed to not only be the Democratic leadership uh, opposed to the Republicans in the legislature, but kind of a slap in the face, maybe I'm editorializing no. it here, but slap in the face to all the rank and file members who had spent so many hours working together on this. I, I I have theorized, and I could be totally wrong, that that was the speaker, again, trying to rein in his caucus, let him know who's who in the zoo, throw some cold water on this whole notion of bipartisanship, and try and change the tone and tenor. And for a little while, he was successful. Um, because, you know, I, like others, took debate. We were clearly, absolutely, unmistakably railroaded. And that wasn't done 
in a vacuum that was done purposefully. And so that kind of worked short term, but then, you know, we had a press conference. Leader Durkin was calm throughout the whole thing, and he goes, look, we're going to protest this vote. It, it's not getting signed by the governor, so we're going to live to fight another day, and we're going to continue to call on our colleagues to work with us. You know, here's the irony of the whole thing. We're 47 members in the House, and yet it's really weird, but we seem to have, because we're staying together, and it's tough because we have different districts, interests, constituencies, but we're sticking together because it gives us a little bit of leverage. A majority with 71 can't get their stuff together and are relying upon us to, to basically raise taxes with them on a partisan budget. We will raise revenue if there's reforms and if you know, a bipartisan tax increase must accompany a bipartisan budget with bipartisan reforms. That's the part they're not quite getting. We're getting there though. We're getting there. I was going to say, you had mentioned uh, in the conversation uh, that our first edition of Across the Aisle with you and Lou Lang that you had uh, said to Mr. Lang, you're not interested in a bipartisan budget, you're interested in a bipartisan, bipartisan tax, tax increase. increase. He wants us to bear the burden and wear the collar of responsibility, but he wants their spending plan and their priorities funded. Well, it doesn't work that way. It's give and take. Um, it's give and take. They're still used to just giving or shoving stample stress. We're more accustomed to taking that, but now we've got the governor's office that provides a little more equal footing. And this is shared governance, still rocky. And so uh, just to use your crystal ball, where do we go from here and what now, what might be the best case scenario as far as? Best case scenario, if we get a budget, we, we use our time extremely wisely. We continue with, and I'm, gonna, I'm going into two meetings tonight with this bipartisan reforms working group. They're going well. We keep working on three or five things we can agree on, put it on the shelf, work through other issues. And by the way, it's pensions, school consolidation, unfunded mandates, uh, property tax freeze, collective bargaining, workers' comp. And, and workers' comp and collective bargaining are hard. They're hard. We have some ideological, philosophical, pretty staunch differences. Having said that, We've already figured out some low-hanging fruit that we can work on. We're going to keep doing that and see if we can't make some measurable progress. Last thing. Again, the uh, bill last night was 500 pages. Yeah. If it were the federal government, we would say it was an omnibus bill. Right. right. Uh, would your preference be, and has there been any thoughts uh, post the vote last night and today, should the budget be passed in a series of independent bills so that you get funding for K through 12, maybe a funding bill for higher education, et cetera, so that members can, uh, pick, and not, uh, pick and choose and not just have it uh, all or nothing at all. There's a strategy to doing both. And obviously, Speaker Madigan decided a more comprehensive omnibus spending plan was easier to sell for his caucus because he knew he wasn't going to get any of our votes. If we're moving in a collaborative fashion towards something structured, I think you'll see a series of votes for that very purpose. It, it get kind of tricky, and, and you know, we have the single purpose rule. You know, the budget is one single purpose. If we're going to have an increase in revenue, we're going to need a variety of bills, how they're put together, structured, and the manner and the, num and the, and the way they're voted on actually needs to be very, thought needs to be very thoughtfully uh, contemplated because that will help construct roll calls because some people will be on some bills and maybe off other bills. Again, I'm getting ahead of myself, but whether you do it in one big bill or not, all depends on the circumstances. I understood what, why the speaker chose his form last night. That worked then for his caucus. Doesn't work for mine. All right, Representative Brown-Sendak, good luck and thank you. See you around, man. All right.